All right, hello everyone. Uh, today we're gonna do it uh, a little bit more fresh edition, <laughs> live from Mother Nature. Uh, and we have a very special guest. Uh, of course, all our guests are special, including the father of our guest today. Uh, if we had uh, Chel Jokna, attorney Chel Jokna, Dean Chel Jokna in the past, now we have uh, uh, his uh, very talented son, Director Pepe Jokna. Thank you very much, uh, Director, for joining us. Richard, thank you for having me. Pleasure. I know that major the connection is not at best, unfortunately. But on sa dami mga umakyat dito sa Baguio, even the internet is a little bit overflowing. But uh, Pepe, before we go into your uh, latest work, no, which is of course Gomborza, and we're seeing a lot of very, very touching uh, reviews coming, including from my former colleague in GMA Network and good friend, of course, Atom. I don't know kung madali mapaluha si Atom Aralio, but uh, it it looks like you did something special there, no? Are you are, are you overwhelmed or surprised by the responses coming from Ricky Lee, from Otto Morelio, from people that both of you and I very much respect? I'm uh, touched, overwhelmed, yeah. I honestly, nalagulat na ako anxiety pala ang MFH. So yesterday I was really, really, over the course of the last few days, I was feeling very anxious about how people would react to the film, receive the film, whether they would understand, whether they would um, feel for it. And so, you know, hearing that initial first few reactions, uh, first, uh, I heard that Atom was, he was seated um, in the same row as me. And I had heard that he had started crying toward the end of the film. Um, and that really um, made me, uh, it, it, it really gave me joy because it, it told me that, it, the film is connecting on an emotional level. And then the day after, when I got a message, a personal message from Sir Ricky, who said that he also liked the film. Yeah, Sir Ricky Kasai is my mentor. Um, he, I studied screenwriting under him. And so to hear that from your mentor was very touching. And then yesterday, uh, you know, we our film is on the lower end of the spectrum when it comes to the number of cinemas playing our film. So we we're all, you know, very, very anxious, very cautious. But then hearing the initial reports of uh, screenings getting sold out uh, all around Metro Manila um, and in the some in in the few provincial screens that we have, and then hearing also reports from our checkers that. Uh, not just our checkers, by the way, but also family and friends who've seen the film, hearing reports of people clapping and, and standing up at the end of the film and, and, and crying at the end of the film. Um, really, really just just made, it's, 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 it's the best prize for me. I, I'm, I'm really, really happy right now. Well, I mean, I, I'm yet to watch it because for some reason, I'm not sure it's available for Shadita Sabagyo. And, and I think by no. the it's not exactly. Yeah, it's not. You know, I was not. hoping to watch it before I interview you, but don't worry. I'll, I'll make sure that you know I'll, I'll assess it on its own terms. Now, I mean, I remember the lines that Nick Joaquin used during the execution part, and then this is the towards the end of the very first chapter of A Question of Heroes, and I was you know brought to tears. I'll be honest about that. And uh, you know, everyone talks about Rizal. Everyone talks about you know your usual suspects of Illustrados, but because before there was the Illustrados, there were of course the Gumborzas, right? And 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 that, that's where my question comes in. Why did you? Why did you think na dapat nagsimula tayo sa Gomburza? So tingin mo ba this was an unexplored part of our history? Or that the psychological and the emotional relevance of that and the impact on the Rizal generation was perhaps not as appreciated uh, by the available film arts and education system that we have? Uh, well, the film originated with Jess with the communications, Jesscom. Um, they have produced, this is their second feature film, they uh, they produced Ignacio de Loyola previously. Um, they had the idea to make the film. Um, and I think for them, it was, of course, a connection to the story of, of priests. At the same time, they had also wanted to make this film as a tribute to the 500 years of the church in the Philippines. Um, and uh, after they got the idea, they, they asked a bunch of directors to, to, you know, to meet and pitch their take on, on the film and, and I had uh, in that process read about the three priests. Uh, my connection was a bit different. Uh, I, of course, got a lot of priests and I don't consider myself a very religious person also. And I, you know, when I, honestly, when I heard celebration of 500 years of the church, 
I also had the question, is that even something to be celebrated? <laughs> but that's but that's me. That's 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 who I am. Um but the more I I I, I read uh about Kompurza, the more I began to understand why, why they were so important beyond them being priests. And this is what I came to just come with. The the, the story, it is just a story not about them as priests but about them as human beings. And when we, when, 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 I, when I said that, they agreed with that. This is a celebration of their humanity because at the time, uh, their humanity was being denied by the Spanish government. They were not given, we, all of us, whether we were uh, Indian or, or half Spanish, we were not given the same rights as people who were born in Spain because they considered colonial us less subjects. human. We were just colonial yes. subjects, yep. Exactly, exactly. So so when we all agreed on that, this is a celebration of humanity. It's a celebration of of, uh, of how the question of humanity um, gave birth to what it means to be Filipino. Then that's where we that's where the ball started to get rolling with the film. Yeah, I mean that's that's a very important intervention. No? I mean, in a way, you joked. I mean, I think. Did you have a background in, in, in Ateneo? I, I I mean, usually in UP, right? The idea is that, oh, Rizal, he was a reformist, blah, blah, blah. It's really Bonifacio was the real revolutionary. No offense to my friends and colleagues in UP, but I always found that the baloney because Rizal's liberalism and republicanism was revolutionary in the context of colonial subjugation. And to push the logic even further, to ask for, you know, you know Filipino-born individuals to be priests and to spread the message of the Lord uh, to the people without direct intervention uh, from Madrid and subjugation, that was a form of revolutionary politics in itself, right? I mean, again, people tend to look at the church a hundred years later, or they tend to extrapolate what's happening back then to today. But we have to understand things in their own context, no? And now, so, so Nick Joaquin considered uh, Padre Borgus as the first major hero uh, in the struggle for Philippine nationalism. What was your understanding of it? What works? What films? Uh, what kind of literature inspired your framing? Of, I mean, there's so many ways to approach the Gomborza uh, martyrdom, right? Who influenced you the most? What was your intellectual and, and historical approach? Uh, well, uh, just to backtrack a little bit, I'm actually not from Ateneo. Uh, I studied in La Salle. And, I also and La Salle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah so honestly, yeah, that's one of the first things. Oh, sorry. That's one of the first things I said. You guys know I'm not from that's <laughs> that's I'm sorry, La Salle. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. Uh, no, but but it, it the, uh, they, of course, they, 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 they had known that I studied in, in La Salle. Ateneans and La Salleans are, are friends. And why even have this dichotomy between the schools? Anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, in terms of research, um, there are a lot of conflicting uh, historical accounts about Kumburza uh, and about the Kavita mutiny, uh, which uh, is the reason why Kumburza was executed. So the Kavita mutiny happened in, in 1872. It was an, an opera, it was a mutiny. Uh, within Fort San Felipe in Cavite. And uh, some accounts had said that it was just, you know, uh, 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 soldiers who are unhappy and wanting more uh, wages or, or less taxes and, and, um, uh, and a few things. We can get into that later. Other accounts had said, no, this was a revolutionary uh, movement. Um, so we... We had considered a script that had, for example, all these, you know, all these uh, competing accounts, and we decided that we needed to stick to one, one account, and and that was uh, heavily informed by the works of Father Schumacher, who is a Jesuit, and also one of our foremost historians, I think, about that era. Um, so Father Schumacher had written a lot about Burgos, about Burgos's manifesto. Uh, which even that Burgos had written a manifesto, which he signed Los Filipinos, which is one of the first uh, documents where we see Filipinos being used as a term to describe us or or at least their group. Um, some accounts say that he wrote it, others didn't. So we had to say, no, uh, we, we, we went to Father Schumacher, who said he did write the Burgos manifesto. Father Schumacher had also written an account of Cavite Mutiny called Cavite Mutiny uh, Definitive History. 
So those were our, our primary sources. And and uh, he had laid out very, uh, very brilliantly, also very succinctly, why he believed that the Cavite mutiny was a revolutionary movement. Um, so you know, those are the two primary sources. And then and then here and there we would get others. Of course, uh, I asked a lot from my Tita Maris, who used to head the National Historical Commission. Um, I, I would call her every now and then, especially during the shoot. Uh, of course, we, me and the actors read a lot of uh, Sir Ambeto Campos' columns. Um, especially, and that uh, helped us, especially with the Garota scene, with the execution. We really pulled up for uh for the execution scene word for word we used the last words of gomez and burgos as uh, as was written in sir ambet's columns um so yeah it, it was it was fun actually doing all that research for this film we ended up with a script that was 130 something almost 140 pages um and then of course we we had to trim it down uh and and so uh, during the pandemic, actually, it took us two years to re really keep working on the script back and forth, um, shorten it, streamline it in terms of, you know, zeroing in on what is the story we're trying to tell here. Uh, and then we ended up with an 85 or so page script, which is what you'll see in the movie house. Yeah, sorry if I'm, I'm geeking over this. Actually, to be honest, the first time I heard about your project was when I was in Madrid uh, earlier this year, around March, we had this, you know, uh, annual Philippine-Spain kind of event, you know, that scholars from both sides come together, uh, experts, officials, and from a good friend of mine, uh, uh, the, I heard that, uh, so we were talking about Philippine-Spain and how, you know, as a Filipino being Spain, it's a kind of a mixed feeling, right? At the same time, there's a kind of a chip on our shoulders uh, because of the whole thing that happened to Rizal. In fact, the occasion of our visit there, because our event was in Institute Cervantes, no, was, uh, you know, Rizal's work officially were inducted into the Hall of Fame of Spanish literature, right? So it was a very special moment, you know, oh. goosebump moment. Uh, so as a Filipino, you feel so proud that a fellow Filipino or, or the father of the Filipino nation in some ways is now part of the Spanish canon. Uh, with Cervantes and the whole thing, uh, Liosa, Marquez, and all of that. But at the same time, of course, there's also this kind of a semi-alienation and bitterness and all of that because of the American influence, the interlude, and everything that came after. Now, uh, so the conversation I was having with friends was, you know, how are we going to rediscover this sense of our Spanish past and also that sense of alienation we have towards the Spanish language? In fact, I was telling, telling my Spanish friends that in the Philippines, Spanish is treated like French. It's like the language of the posh and elite and they were like super shocked it's like yeah like this you know like like in, like in the in the u.s spanish is the language of you know what i'm saying right but but to philippines like the one the ones who speak spanish are like the elite and posh and then in that context your your movie and project came you know, was was discussed by friends i didn't know you were the director but the the organization that we're mentioning um was so i was wondering like hmm is this going to be a religious movie or a historical movie? And how are they going to put it together? So when I got to know it's actually you who is overseeing it, I felt very confident because I know you're not a particularly religious person. And I think the reason I call Ateneo, because I remember your TED talk in Ateneo about uh, yeah. what's holding. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. So there was a kind of visual. Yeah. Uh, so we'll discuss that separately because I want to also yeah. take your uh, get your take on the Philippine cinema as general. Uh, but now let's focus on this movie yet. What was the thing that, push you uh where does this as a, as a writer if you're going to write something i always say okay i just feel this issue was not properly discussed or i can do a better job right or i have to refresh this for a new generation right you have to justify putting two years of your life into writing 400 pages or so right i'm sure for a director like you this is also a very exacting job what is the thought process behind it, uh pepe yeah well for me uh the core of it was um, the, the the little tidbit that the term Filipino came from the movement of these uh, Philippine-born priests. But at the time, uh, people who were born here, who were living here, did not call ourselves Filipino. We called our we were called Indios. The Spanish called us uh, Peninsulares. The people who were born in Spain were called Insulares. Between us. Who were born here, we would divide ourselves or call ourselves according to our region. So I'm Tagalog, I'm Visaya, or Suano, I'm Bicolano, etc. 
Um, but the term Filipino had begun with the secularization movement of the three of the priests, of which uh, Gomborza were a part of, and then it sort of spread uh, from from them to other sectors of society. The ilustrados that we uh, call now they had begun to also imbibe the word, uh, and then it spread until the uh, the revolution actually. So that to me caught my fascination: the idea that a word could spread that a f- like a fire and it could capture the imagination of a people and also unite a people because we were very much i think fragmented then in the in sense that uh the concerns of the uh the illustrado class were not shared by the concerns of the indios quote unquote and were not shared by the concerns of uh people uh, um, local born who were in the military but when Gomborza was killed um, and everybody saw that they had all converged on these three, three priests and went, that, that's me. That's, that's the, the injustice that they face is the same injustice that I, I, I face or can face. And that was, our, that was a unifying moment for us as a country. Uh, so that, that's, that's the core that, that inspired me with the film. And, 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 and uh, Director Jok, I mean, I, of course, if you go back to your own family, I think your great grandfather was involved in this, right? He was one of one of the first admirals. So essentially, you can say one of the first admiral of the Philippines. Uh, you know, the 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 great joke, no, no, uh, the first one. And if I'm not mistaken, you guys are related even to uh, Marikina. I mean, like the the one of the back in the day centuries before you know so i was just doing oh, a really? sound check about you joke really? but, but, but does your own family's uh background your great grandfather's contribution to the revolution did that also kind of contribute to your sense of responsibility passion that you have to keep this going i'm sorry if that that came like oh. a curveball but i was also i didn't also know that i knew your grandfather uh the great joke no but but i didn't know that your great great grandfather was was such a central figure in the philippine revolution yeah, he was. He he was actually uh there. I, there's like I think statues of him in Visayas because he led, I think, the revolution in um in Visayas. Although he was from Taal, Batangas, um, uh, I I would hear stories of him growing up, uh, but they were like m- more like light anecdotes. Like I I heard uh that he was so fat. Uh, <laughs> that he got shot once in the stomach, pero hindi to magos, because he was so fat, so it didn't it didn't penetrate his internal organs. <laughs> uh, but 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 yeah, it's only rec- in recent years that I also started to learn more about him. Um, Seriously, and, and but there you go. Yeah, I mean, of course we're talking about yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Ananias. Yeah, Ananias. Yeah, Ananias. Yeah, exactly. Ananias. Yeah. I, I visited. Great, great time, yeah, I, I visited his grave for the first time last year for the fir- or for the first time this year actually all this time it's he has been buried in the uh the al cathedral the al cathedral um uh, is a beautiful a large i think it's it, sorry the Alba, the Alba basilica is, the, is a very beautiful large i think it's one of the largest in southeast asia um church it sits on a hill overlooking the whole town of taal and then you can see the lake in the distance uh we shot there actually uh Gomburza was shot in taal uh, and as well as in Quezon in Manila in, in Tomorrow's. But yeah, he was buried, he is buried there. And so for the first time I visited and, um, but yeah, it, it, uh, I'm also sort of geeking out on that part of history. I'm, I'm the reason I, I'm just throwing that before we go back. I'm sorry, Major, all over the place. <laughs> but I'm just, I'm just telling you, there's so many amazing stories. I mean, that, to, to, you know, to extrapolate and make movies about. I mean, I, I was just looking at the news a few days ago from Vatican, etong ex samurai who became a priest coming to the Philippines and now being considered for a saint. You know, this is Dom Yosto Takayama, right? I mean, like, there's oh, shit. So I know, I mean, an ex samurai. That's a movie. That's a movie. Yeah, that's a movie, right? <laughs> I was just, I was just thinking. So he was, he was, you know, martyred in the Philippines. Uh, you know, um, so he was a former elite. Samurai, he gives up his family, he comes over to the Philippines, he becomes a priest, he performs miracles, and now Vatican is considering uh beatifying him into a, into a saint. So, I mean, those are like stories that, was, that you cannot make up, man. I mean, this is out of this world. Yeah, I how was he martyred? Who how was he martyred? 
like you're able to kill a samurai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I know <laughs> this. This is something. So sorry if I'm geeking over that. Now, uh, going back to uh, before our gentleman, our friend here. Now, going back to this uh, Gomburza, how did you come about with your um casting choices? I mean, obviously you had a lot of handy. That last time I checked, like Gomburza, uh, uh, Padre Borges was our age, right? I, I think it was like 34, 35, right? We're the same age apparently. So. What was how, how did you choose the uh young casting? How was it influenced by the actual historical facts and details? Mm. Uh yes, Burgos and Zamora were uh, around mid thirties, thirty four, thirty five. Uh, I was surprised actually when I started doing research. One of the first things that surprised me was that Gomez was much older. He was around late seventies when he was killed. Because the the popular rendition, which I think was drawn by Rizal, uh, shows the three priests that they all look at the same age. Uh, so I, was, I found it really surprising. Yeah, but they're like um, almost two, three, uh, almost like two generations apart, right? Almost. Yeah. 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 Uh, so it, the casting began with having all these characters that we had in the script, and then we tried as much as possible to look for reference photos for each. So first the three priests, and then Pelaez, uh, and then it was really a matter of looking. It was important for me to cast actors who were a little bit. Um, who had a resemblance to the act to to the, the real thing? Uh, I don't know why actually, but it's it's it, for me it was it was just a sense of like being faithful, I guess. Uh, I also sort of didn't want. I I knew that we had a smaller budget also, and we didn't have a lot of time to shoot the film. We actually only shot the film in seventeen days, uh, which is very very short for a historical film. So I knew we didn't have that time to Wait, do prosthetics. You, you did the whole thing in just over two weeks? Yeah, yeah, just wow. 17 days. Just over two spaced, weeks? Yeah, spaced wow. out over the course of uh, yeah. two months. But still, but, but still, yeah, yeah. 17 shooting days. So yeah, we didn't have the time or budget to do a lot of prosthetics. So that's why um, the, the resemblance was important to me. So... Cedric, for example, if you put his picture side by side with Burgos, it's for me, it's it's uncanny. I, I think he really does. He looks like Burgos, but he also imbibes, I think, uh, the spirit of Burgos that I had read in Burgos's writings. So the same was for uh, Sir Dante Rivero and for An Chong. Uh, it started with those times, but I really, really did believe them. I, I really do love them as, as actors. Uh, Piolo, actually, Piolo. If you put Piolo side by side with the picture of Pelaez, Pelaez, yes, like yes, square, yes, square jawed, look like a you know, look like a movie star. Uh, Pelaez is actually, is actually one of, I think, uh, one of also an unsung hero, uh, in yeah. our history, some someone that we owe a lot to, also. So I'm happy that he said yes to the film, but yeah, so it, it was that I had a Google Sheet. With all of the characters' names and all of the pictures, and then um, actors that we wanted to cast, and then we, I really did pitch them one by one. Uh, I did meet with them one by one to tell them what the film was about, uh, what who their character is, and um, to also tell them that it wasn't going to be a typical kind of shoot; that it was going to be um, quite challenging, especially for. Uh, the, the priests who had Spanish dialogue, like they needed to commit to working with this a language coach and getting the Spanish right. And and the prop, I mean, just not any Spanish, the Spanish of the Castilians during that time, right? I mean, it, or or the Filipino Spanish, right? The Filipinized Spanish also is quite different from Spanish Spain, right? So I, I don't know. I, I'm sure we have Spanish language experts who are gonna have their own praise for the effort that you well, put. Hopefully, in. hopefully. Yeah, hopefully, 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 I'm, I'm still hopefully. waiting for but, the expert. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, but but language was also an important part uh, of of the film. We did. I didn't want, for example, the 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 Spanish governor general or the Spanish friars to be speaking in Filipino, um, because it, it, it's 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 not historically accurate. Yeah. But also, but also because we wanted to heighten the feeling of this is us and that's them. And they, 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 you know, they were, they felt they were above us. They were speaking a different language. So when it came to the Filipino characters, quote unquote, in our film, we all had them speaking Tagalog. Uh, but it was very important for us that the governor general, the Spanish friars, uh, anything that had to deal with, you know, uh, being in court, uh, that had to be in, in Spanish. That's a very important point. No, I mean, um, I mean, you and I have been all around the world and have dealt with all sorts of people, but. 
I'll admit it. Uh, you know, the first time I was in Spain, and and you know, and I was in this quite a regal place, right? I, I won't say exactly where. It was a very regal place, and then the Spanish officials were coming out and giving speeches. It is very sophisticated, my very accent and all of that. So, like for a moment, I said I transposed myself. I said, if I were the same non-white man, yeah, here 100, 120 years ago, how would I feel? And if I couldn't speak Spanish exactly like them, let's say I'm still articulate, but I couldn't speak it with that kind of you know, accent, posh Madrid accent. And and you could see that they would look at me as a colonial subject. Like, and and you know, we're in a woke era, let's be honest. You know, we have uh, us, the non, you know, Caucasian, non-Western people have some voice and platform today, but 120, 140, 150 years ago, my goodness, the level of courage and audacity you had to have. So I, I like the fact that you emphasize that the, 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 the language, I won't say barrier, but but the kind of a language case or cast, no? And also... The, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, they, 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 the most Filipinos at the time did not speak Spanish and could not understand Spanish. Um, yeah. So I, I, I actually do not know uh, why they didn't, why they, they because I, I know that the, it's in the film. One of the lines in the film is that the king, there was a, there was a, a decree, I think, a royal decree that Spanish must be taught to the natives. But it was the friars who did not uh, uh, do a good job in, in, in teaching. I, I, I don't know what it is. And I don't know what the difference is between us mm -hmm. and, and in Mexico, where in Mexico, uh, the locals were taught Spanish. That, that's, um, well, I mean, of yeah. course, the argument there is the uh, the friars had an interest in monopolizing the language because monopoly in the language was a, a sort of monopoly on power, right? Because if you don't know the language, you cannot fight it in the courts. You cannot speak the language of power, right? So there was, you're correct, <laughs> there was some tension between the civilian secular administration in Spain, which at times was actually quite liberal and influenced by the mm -hmm. Napoleonic Code and the very conservative, some would say retrogressive, friars who had an interest in keeping a certain medieval feudalistic structure in the Philippines, right? Which is a very different trajectory from the rest of Latin America. Kaya sabi ko, ang Philippines is parang, it's a double solitude, right? We're very dissimilar from most of our Asian counterparts. At the same time, we're also yeah. very dissimilar from Latin Americans, a lot of whom had huge influx of Spanish people and very much were drenched in the Spanish language in ways that we're not. Yeah. So, yeah, siguro our identity crisis and all of these problems we're facing could also go to that weird, exceptional situation we had in the Philippines in the late 19th century. And yet, we had these revolutionaries. And yet, we had these martyrs, right, against all odds. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You mentioned identity crisis. No, that, 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 to me, is still, still like a, a burning question that I don't have any answers to. Now, uh, uh, before we transition to the other next part, which is, you know, I want to get your ideas on the Philippine cinema, etc. Why do you think people should watch this movie? I mean, uh, not as a salesman. I mean, obviously, you're the director. You want people to go out there. This movie, I, I you know, I'm, I'm going to endorse it 100 times. Don't worry about it. But, but why do you think as Filipinos, we should watch a movie like this? And what are the things we should look forward to? What is, what is a unique thing that Pepe Jokno brings to this movie? Because, you know, Thankfully, this is not the first great historical movie. I mean, we can have a debate about the effect of General Luna movie. I mean, my theory is that it helped Duterte come to power right? <laughs> by glorifying and romanticizing the strongman, the cost, cost, you know, the uh, the costly strongman. Kutub ko si Digong nga yung yung nagmumura siya, ginaya lang niya si General Luna. May meron kong ane suspecha jane. But you know, we 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 have a recent history over the past ten years. All this historical biopic coming up and doing well commercially. They're making pop culture effect and even political effect. So I mean, what is it? Is, is there something unique here uh, about your approach, or what makes it unique? Uh, and why should people watch this as Filipinos? Uh, um, I'll, I'll talk about it as a, from from the perspective of Muna Gumburza, because I think Gumburza is uh, the. It doesn't fit the mold of what we consider a historical, uh, you know, hero. Um, actually, when I first uh, entered the project and I was talking to a, a historian about it, uh, the historian was quick to point out that these, uh, this person, technically they're not heroes; they are martyrs. 
Can you make the distinction uh, uh, between martyrs and heroes? Uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, well, uh, they were killed for their cause, but uh, we have to, they were three priests actually who never fought on the battlefield. I guess is what the person was trying to say. I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not so sure. Um, and, and you know, there's there there was there's still all that uh, speculation about. I mean, there were these, as I mentioned a while ago, uh, competing uh, texts about whether Burgos did or didn't write his manifesto. Again, we went with. Father Schumacher, who said that he did. But uh, yeah, these three unassuming priests who were caught in a political uh, upheaval, a time of political upheaval, they were not like... Uh, um, and also, we have to remember that they lived at a time when the concept of us being an independent nation was a dec was years away. Yeah, so so um, the, the proximity to the revolution... Uh, is farther than uh, Rizal and Bonifacio, number one. And and, and, and all of the heroes that we've seen in film um, recently. Number two, uh, they, as I mentioned, were not, uh, didn't fight in the battlefield. And at the same time, uh, they, they didn't lead those revolutionary movements. So I, when I first entered, I also, the project, I also asked myself, what's the hullabaloo about these three unassuming priests. Uh, and then I started to read, and I read that Jose Rizal had been so inspired by the Katipunan that he dedicated El Fili. Uh, sorry, so, sorry, inspired by the three priests that he dedicated Martyrdom. El Fili Busterisma uh, to Gomburza. And in a letter to a friend, he also said that without Gomburza, he says he would not have written his two novels. He says he would probably be uh, a Jesuit friar, something like that. Um, why was why was Rizal so inspired by by them? Why was Ratipunan so inspired by Gumburza that uh, Ratipunan actually used um, pieces of black cloth as anting anting um, in, in the membership rites as well, believing those, that those pieces of black cloth were pieces from the cut from the sutanas of the three priests. And so the more I started doing research and the more I dug into their story and as we were making the film, I understood why uh, our heroes were inspired by these martyrs. And it's because uh, I feel that the story of these three priests is the story not of individual heroism, but the story of the collective. The story of how an idea can travel from person to person uh, it's the story not just of battle, but also of sacrifice. And I think these uh, are very Filipino values. We tend, I think, hopefully, we tend to value the collective uh, more than the individual. I think that uh, is also common within Asian societies. And then when I, when, when I sort of thought, I mean, when I um, had uncovered that sort of angle to it, that's when I realized that, that that's what our... Uh, he was so, so inspired by. They were so inspired by by, by those values that Kumborza had espoused, um, and, and I, so that's why I think it's it, the story is important. Uh, it is different from you know right. the usual singular bombastic hero that we're used to, but it's a, a message that I think we still need to to learn that you know that, that all of us carry these little fires within us. Uh, all of us have the responsibility to protect them. All of us have a, a role in this collective story that we have as Filipinos. Uh, and and sometimes the outcomes are not going to be great for us. Sometimes it could cost us our, our life, our liberty, but we should not quit. And we should be, I think, brave in, in the face of these challenges. That's what I, I loved about right. the story of Gomburza. I mean, my way of looking at it is two ways. Spiritually, I mean, there's always a John the Baptist before, I mean, before Jesus Christ, right? There was a John the Baptist, right? Uh, you know, even if you're not the final Messiah, there's always this very important figure, right? Uh, that lays the foundation, right? For the fulfillment of the prophecy. So there's that's one way of looking at things. That, you know, even though certain individuals were not the revolutionary per se, the conscious political actors, they helped create, the emotional, the psychological, and the political conditions for that. I don't think the Philippines was the same place after 
the execution of the Gomburza, right? I think this affected not only Rizal, his brother, everyone who watched it, everyone was shaken to their core because the injustice of the system, the barbarity of the system was really embodied by what happened, especially the emotional way they responded to their execution. Like, we're not against the system. We're, you know, it just showed how ridiculous exactly. that colonial system was. So, but the second thing, you know, in a way you could say they were accidental revolutionaries, right? I mean, in many ways, the greatest figures in history were not consciously trying to contribute to a political outcome. A lot of times, reformers become inevitable revolutionaries when they want to change things from within. I mean, we can talk about French Revolution, Russian Revolution. So so for me, I, I personally see the Gomborzas as not only martyrs, but if not conscious revolutionaries, at least they were the accidental revolutionaries in a spiritual sense. Maybe there's John Baptist that came after. You know, you know, they created the conditions for what would happen yeah. a decade or two later. And, and and I would also, yeah, venture and call them heroes as well. I mean, um, I think heroes are are titles are called the term of the, the title of hero is something that we as people give. And if Kumborza gives us this feeling, if Kumbur, um of of inspiration, of being Filipino, of patriotism, if Kumborza stands for something bigger than us as individuals, then I think they should be called definitely be called heroes. Right. And then last point on, on the movie, if um what is the what is the Pepe joke no oeuvre, right? Or what Oof. is the special touch? Is it the cinematography? Is it the emotional aspect of this? I mean, because in fairness, you know, you move in Cesar Montana's Rizal. I think there was a lot of, uh, you know, investment in the language, in the authenticity. I was very impressed by that movie, the emotionality of it. I think with the Henry Luna movie, the, 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 again, the emotion of the moment, the, uh, and even the, uh, the script, everything was very sophisticated. But, but I think one of the things you're known for, and also one of the things that I see in the initial reviews is, it's just this absolutely stunning uh, cinematography that captures just the inanity of the injustices of that moment, but also the the emotional depth and the tragedy that that martyrdom of Gomborza represented. Am I am I, am I over reading into this? I mean, what, how do you see that? what how, what is your read on that? Uh, with uh, Pepe, I I I I don't know. <laughs> I I I I I don't know what to how I mean. Sorry, I don't know how to define what my touch is, but on the cinematography, I was very, very um, lucky, honored that uh, Carlo Mendoza uh, agreed to do the cinematography. Carlo is a good friend. He also did, uh, he's done a lot of historical films, actually. He did Rosario. He did Bonifacio, I think. He's uh, one of my favorite uh, cinematographers. Not, you know, not just... Um, I mean, looking at his works that, you know, uh, we did work on together. So Carlo, I think, and I have a very good working relationship where at the beginning of the process, we really align on what we what we think the film is about, what we think the, the message of the film is. And uh, from there, our, our, our visual language comes out. Um, so we had a lot of discussions with me Carlo and uh, Erickson, uh, my production designer, as well as uh, Paul and Ernest, our producers, we we had uh, uh, weeks of going through the script and, and discussing what it means, not just from a production perspective, but from a uh, narrative and from um, uh, a storytelling perspective, but also what the messages that we're trying to portray. Uh, and from those discussions, the ideas, you know, the 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 images of fire came out like it was a present thing it wasn't in the script but it was in all of our heads and so that that fire the little flames uh carlo eventually used in the cinematography um there are some scenes that are pretty dark especially in the, the prison scene that's only lit by candles because we wanted to show you know that that these little flames still you know struggling within this you know giant um uh patch of darkness and then there are other scenes where it there may not be candles, but the sky looks like flame. Uh, so that was all informed by this this message that we had of, of a little fire that just kept growing and growing and growing until it became uh, the nation that we are now. And and and, baby, I mean, 
what is the impact you're hoping this movie to have and what do you think uh you know the audience should look forward to if there's a one or three things perhaps they should look forward to uh ano masabi mo because i'm seeing already a lot of people are saying this is on their number one list of things to watch uh in the coming days or so yeah i'm i'm, I'm really happy uh yesterday i was being sent some messages uh of um people who had watched the film uh And then they were saying that at the end of the film, people were crying, people uh, were clapping. Uh, other reports, Tikin Sebu Maitita said her friend had watched, and uh, people stood up and they had clapped at the end. Uh, yeah, I, I just came from Mega Mall actually because we did I did the rounds a while ago with uh, Cedric and Chong, uh, Tommy who plays uh, Bon Camino, and Elijah who plays Pashano. So we went to um, SM North, and then in SM Mega Mall we were able to catch the end of the film. And really, at the end of the film, it was it made my uh, hair stand because people were were, yeah, were good crying. Songs, and, yeah, yeah. yeah, people were crying and, and, and clapping at the end of the film. We went in front of the, the of the screen as the credits were rolling to say thank you, and people really came forward. Like we couldn't stop them, but we had this isang nanay who uh, couldn't stop herself. She while we were talking, she came forward and then she she hung. Um, She hugged Cedric, and and she was crying, and and she said, uh, she was thanking him for his performance as Burgos. So that that to me was like is is like the best, uh, uh, this is the best part of this process. Like I found seeing that kind of reaction, um, it was amazing. Because this is supposed to be a conversation too, right? A conversation with the audience, and you want to start a conversation after this. Uh, speaking of which, Pepe. <laughs> I don't want to get ahead of myself or ahead of you in that sense, but should we look forward to this being a beginning of a new kind of a series or a, a kind of a genre of this kind? Of, because honestly, I, I really, don't, I really think there's so much that we need to properly understand about where we come from. All of this identity crisis, political crisis, all of these problems we're having today as Filipinos in the 21st century, the root of that is because we don't understand the root or we don't go back enough to the root in ways that a lot of our neighbors do, right? I mean, you and I yeah. are around the world. I mean, go to I don't know, Turkey, China, Israel, whatever country. A lot of them are very deeply rooted in their history. And I just felt we have such a rich history Uh, but thankfully now, finally, we're having this enriched approach to understanding the history. Uh, do you see this as part of a beginning of a new era of more historically, uh, you know, historically relevant and socially relevant at the same time, emotionally compelling kind of stories uh, in the Philippines? I hope. I hope. We, I hope producers never stop producing uh, historical films because it is a risk. Uh, not all historical films have. Uh, been successful actually, and so we just taking on this project, and 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 combined with the fact that it's more expensive to produce a historical film because you have to do the sets and and the locations and and the props and all that, and uh, do a lot of work to get back to the era. Uh, but I I hope and I I hope that uh at least cinema helps. Uh, but yeah, discussions uh will also definitely uh, put forward. I was thinking a lot about this actually recently because. It, Uh, I came from Italy, and uh, a few months ago, we were being toured around uh, Torino, which is a city up north. It was the original capital of Italy before it was moved down, uh, which is now it's so it's now in Rome. And my friend, uh, who was touring us around, she was geeking about a politician named Cavour. I think that's the name. I'm. Am I getting it right? Anyway, I, I, yes, yes, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, and and because uh, uh, I think the agreement to make Italy a republic came was signed in Torino, and then from there the the ruling family in Torino had unified uh, entire Italy, and once they had done so, uh, she was saying my favorite quote from Cavour is, uh, "Okay, now we made Italy, next we have to make Italians." And and I um, it's a national project, so, yeah. It's a project, it's, yeah. It's a project. It's, yeah. it's a project. It's an ongoing project. Like we tend to think of, we tend to look at countries and and think that they organically, maybe they did, but that that they that they that they didn't work for their nationhood. But actually, the truth is, they did. They had to construct it. They had to build it, brick by brick. So, uh, the Italian language I think that we know now was actually not 
widely spoken at the beginning of the last century. Like it was a language they all had to learn, which reminds me of Bahasa Indonesia, for example, which I think they chose, if I'm not mistaken, the least spoken dialect and made that their national language in order to foster unity. Even just like things like uh, I, I read recently that Pad Thai is actually not a very true. It's a mo it's a modern creation that uh, their government had had. Uh, well, the same with the Germans and and, and and the same with German and this I mean Deutsch uh, and the same thing with the I mean look at Spain today up until today it's not a finished project Catalonia and still a lot of them exactly. still want to separate from Spain right they're still Basque right where a lot of Filipinos including you know my Foronda family name that's the Basque name you know it's even Spain Madre España supposedly it's still a national project that is incomplete so I think. We Filipinos yeah. have this romanticized idea that oh, suerte uh, naman mga kapit bayan natin mga ibang bansa. They they were born with the notion of a nation. No, it's a project. It comes with sacrifice. It comes with investment. It comes with emotional attachment. It comes with people like you and me. I mean, sharing our ideas and getting ideas and and debating about it. So a Filipino yeah, exactly. is an evolving project, right? I mean, it is creating Filipinos is an evolving project, and we are a young country. Uh, I would say relatively. Uh, so what are the stories that we tell each other? What do we, what, how do we describe ourselves to one another? That is all part of the construction of our Filipino identity. So if we don't have it now, then um, we have to keep building it. And and that's the reason why I mean uh, uh, Pepe I mean I always have this problem about ang ang Filipino ay Moreno again again no, no, I mean look at the first Filipinos a lot of them were Creole look at Manuel Quezon uh, he was a Creole our first you know com our Commonwealth president uh, look at a lot of our Ilustrados they were uh, part Chinese mestizo part Spanish I mean the idea that you know just being Malayan Tagalog speaking to be a Filipino I mean that's a myth because from the very beginning we were a very cosmopolitan inclusive nation and many different quote unquote races and ethnicities it is women men contributed to the birth of the Philippine nation especially considering mga gumburs I mean if you look at even the gumburs right Padre Borgos himself I think the father was Guardia Civil no had a Spa uh, Spaniel yes. blood and part Cordilleran Ilocana if I'm not mistaken I mean I'm in Baguio right now in the north right so so a lot of them were from very mixed mixed ethnic and uh, you know yes. even background yeah uh, Gomez I had some uh, Chinese blood I think Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, there's the Filipino is not so, one oh, yeah, yeah. Or, or the other thing. It's really all of these things uh, put together. Um, in the last 10 minutes, I want to go back, uh, if, yeah. if possible. Can you put up, put your hat as as the kind of a film cinema guy? I, I, I want your, the, the word expert because, you know, you're too humble for that. But I remember your TEDx talk in Ateneo. Uh, that's why I made the mistake in Ateneo. About yung basa mo dun sa ugat ng problema sa Philippine cinema. Bakit bumaba yung kalidad ng cinema sa Pilipinas? Bakit tayo napag-iwanan ng mga ibang bansa? Bakit ngayon Korea and all of that? At ang idea mo is that hindi ito sa kakulangan ng talento, hindi ito sa kakulangan ng mga director at mga artista and actors. Marami tayong talento. It's all about organization and more importantly, regulation. So since you gave that talk, it's like a decade ago, if I'm not mistaken, um, how have things changed for the better? And, and, and at the same time, we're seeing all of these amazing Filipino movies coming up. We have, we're seeing the revival of OPM. So what's going on here? What has changed for the better? If not the government, maybe what's going on? Can you tell, tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I think things have changed from a, a T perspective. The adjustment tax was lowered from 30% to 10 uh, and we did have a system before where that remaining 10 could be waived. I think that was struck down by the Supreme Court a few years ago. But some uh, some cities uh, uh, do give some in tax breaks or tax incentives. And I think since the, the, the amusement tax was lowered, we've seen more and more films getting made. Um, we there, have, there are some efforts by FDC. Be for example to invest in local civil production developments, um, but it's 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 a process that really takes decades. I was talking to a maker from Korea, who had who who said you know in in the sixties, seventies, eighties, nobody really watched Korean films because the Korean films were not good. At all, but it's in the talk. They they had some protections for their cinema. They had a they were in 
um, uh, only Korean films are are where uh, each cinema has to play X number of Korean films, something like that. Um, and because of that, their industry grew and grew and grew. And as they grew, their output got better. And then they are what they are. Uh, uh, yeah, so I think we, we the old, in, in our industry, the only protection that we have right now is MMFF. Uh, during MMFF week, uh, uh, only Filipino films are played. Uh, it gives us equal, it, it gives us, you know, um, uh, a leg up. Uh, because it, it is hard to compete with the cinema of Hollywood, for example, or uh, or, or or Korea. Um, but we need to give ourselves a protection and that opportunity so that we can build our industry and also build our audience. Um, I, I was talking to, again, this is another, uh, I be, okay, I, I will say this. Go I ahead, go ahead, please. I was talking to safe space. The, uh, safe space. Yeah. Okay, okay. I, I was talking to, uh, I was talking to a streamer and um, this was, uh, okay, fine. Talking more and more local content and we're very nice, good success with Filipino content. Like the Filipino films and series that have been coming out now are constantly ranking in their top 10, not just in the Philippines, but we're also hitting worldwide. And I think they're, they're seeing little by little uh, that Filipinos are, are looking for Filipino content and that Filipino content is good. Uh, our Filipinos has the, the, uh, the power, the ability to, uh, to, you know, to reach a wider audience. But... A year, no, two years ago, and I was having this conversation. Um, no, Pepe, sorry, my connection is not a little bit good. So I'm just turning off my video okay. so we can have more bandwidth. So please go ahead. So you were saying, you know, what is the good change that okay. you're seeing right okay. now in the Philippine cinema? Sorry about that. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, uh, again, the stream. Are, are, uh, but a year, uh, two years ago, I was having this conversation and um, I was asking, why don't you invest more? And uh, this person said that honestly, because even if we don't um, invest in Filipino content, Filipinos will still watch. They'll still watch us for Hollywood. They'll still watch us for Korean. Uh, we don't need to produce Filipino content. That's what this person said. And 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 um, so it it presents us with a chicken and egg problem of like, uh. How do we build the audience first? But how do we build the audience if we're not producing the films? So it all has to go hand in hand. You know, we need to invest in films and in production so that we can build the audience and then we grow and grow and grow until we reach a level like Korea. But it's 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 really going to take uh, a lot of effort and a lot of of um, resources and, and protection. Uh, speaking of, of protection, uh, France, for example, has a law where the streamers, if they are making X number of money from French audience, invest it again in French productions, uh, which is why the streamers are compelled to produce French content. And uh, a lot of, of uh, filmmakers that I've, I've talked about that say that that's really helped their industry uh, their 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 audience and i think that we should have something like that because if you think about it they're, they're they're making money from filipino viewers and all that money just goes out of the country i think it's only right that some of it comes back in and helps local productions i think i i hope i don't get uh in trouble for any of that <laughs> no, not at all. No, you're not the first one to to mention it. You know, we we talked to a number of other directors and people are involved. I mean, even see OG Diaz, no, uh, nakausap ko a few months ago. You know, uh, about the Philippine cinema and all. I mean, I agree with the chicken or egg issue, but I think it's also about respecting the Filipino audience. I think if you really give them good product, you give it a little bit of chance. 
the Filipino people will also give you a chance. I think it's it's uh, it's not only arrogant, but I think it's a little bit insulting also to the Filipino audience to say nang purong gusto lang nila is alam mo na fill in the blank, right? Yes, of course, exactly. people want exactly. junk food once in a while. I mean, but, but people also want fine dining once in a while. You just have to give them the chance, and as you correctly pointed out, create the economic conditions for that. Proper regulation, tax breaks, proper protection. Uh, it's a form of industrial policy. I mean, the same thing if you want to build manufacturing. Right, exactly. It's, the, it's, it's it like is. any industry that you have to protect and help flourish. Yeah, and I think you know the, the uh, just going to the cinemas. The cinemas are packed now. Uh, the lines are, are so long. Uh, it's 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 so nice to see. Um, a few months ago, a cinema ran up a, a promo where they sold tickets for sixty five pesos, and the lines were like. Uh, it was so hard to get a ticket. All the screenings were sold out, and the screens that they and the films that they were showing were uh, local independent films. So it's obviously the market's there. Obviously, the audience is there. Uh, the audience is looking for Filipino content, uh, and I think yeah that that it that everybody's starting to see already now that uh, that an investment made in Filipino films, hopefully, I think will do well. And and I mean I saw with the OPM right there is a revival in OPM a lot of our OPM act, uh, artists are making it global some of them even working with the Eminem company and all of that do you see at the same parallel uh, development in the cinema or uh, you know uh, millennials Gen Zs coming together a Gen Z and younger audience uh, more patronizing and supportive of the Filipino content not falling for the usual Hollywood and and all of that there I mean I, I know malakas ang Korea ngayon but 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 the other thing I want to also ask here OG yeah. uh, oh, so I see your conversation with OG Diaz is still there no Pepe I mean the other thing is do you also think we really have to a little bit up also our you know script do we have a problem with enough diversity in scripts and plot twists uh, and, and the character building, complexity of the characters for that matter. Uh, what are the areas we can improve also in terms of the talent and, or sorry, in terms of the product, not also in terms of, kasi puro tayong, anong kulang sa government, anong kulang sa audience, but, you know, it's also about what we are supplying, what we're, we're providing to the audience in this very competitive world, right? And in spite all of the regulatory hurdles. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks for that, Richard. I, I, I want to just backtrack a little bit and say that uh, I have nothing against Hollywood and Korea. I love Hollywood films. I love Korean films. Big fan of them, and I will continue to watch them. I will buy tickets to them. But hopefully, within that mix, also more and more people start to watch Filipino films. And I agree that yes, government support uh, is essential. Um, and at the same time, though, you know, when you talk about Filipino films and uh, sorry, when you talk about Korean films to audiences they'll always tell you ang ganda kasi ng kwento ang ganda ng kwento and then they'll get into of course Pogi or Artista uh, maganda yung cinematography maganda yung effects or etc but at the, but they'll always say maganda ang kwento and I think um, in Korea in developing their uh, their industry they fo did focus a lot on story Hollywood did which is why there's a Hollywood template there's a Hollywood bible now down to the last page they know how a film is supposed to be laid out i think uh that we definitely uh story i think is an area where we need to um to pour a lot of development into more uh, i just came from a screenwriting uh workshop uh, this year so i spent um 3 weeks in italy over the last six months uh, on a script writing bootcamp. And I learned so much about uh, story structure that I had never uh, realized actually before and, and the script development. So yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I was talking to uh, a friend, fellow workshopper from Africa, and she said, oh, in Africa, we have our, our number one problem, she said, is that we have so many scripts that are underdeveloped. The ideas are great, but the scripts are underdeveloped. And I, I think that if our scripts were better developed, then they would be able to sell more internationally and locally. And I, 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 I commiserated with her. I think I, think I agree. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, like I said, but I, I usually, I'm, you know, as a writer, I usually, I'm just so amazed with American television. You no, know? and and someone said something. There was this, this British, uh, you know, the, the intellectual said something like, "This is the golden era of." American television in the sense that they're attracting the best 
writers. I mean, people who could have been your Fitzgerald yeah. and Hemingways are now working in the television industry. That's why ang ganda ng mga series sa US. I, I'm not a fan necessarily of Hollywood movies, but I think the American television series are really, really witty and good and also there's so they're also attracting the good minds, the right minds. No? So, so siguro, it's also about creating the incentives to bring in the best Filipino writers, right? Wherever in yes, the world yes. you contribute and, to the script. Because investment yan eh. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and giving them power, paying them well, giving them the rights uh, to their works, etc. Um, unfortunately, writers in the Philippines are, are I think, one of the uh, the most, it's, I think it's an overlooked job in the sense that, you know, they're not really rewarded or the, the, uh, the, the rights that they get to the films are not, you know, uh, it's, it's not, not even standardized, actually. Yes, it's not commensurate to what to be, they bring to the table. I mean, like, you know, we have all of these writers' guild uh, strikes in Hollywood recently. They were very successful. Uh, even in the era of streaming, they were able to get huge concessions from the big studios and houses, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Pepe. I mean, there's so much more I, I want to discuss, but I, I'm scared that I'm the only one left in the jungle right now. But, <laughs> but you can see I'm so... Where are I'm, you? I'm in the I'm in the park. I'm here in Jolte, Canina. Ah, so, okay. traffic and all. I said it's a hopeless case na makana pa ako ng uh, coffee shop because everywhere is completely full. I said hopeless case na makauwi ako in time. Uh, assuming the internet is gonna be. I said you know what? I'm just gonna sit here and we're gonna get this going. I know you're a super busy guy, and I really look forward, Pepe, to to this conversation for quite some time. I just may light. Yeah, I know. I've I've been following uh you know your your commentaries. It looks like the joke no thesis on tax break is bearing truth to a certain degree. Um, but I hope your other advices will also be taken in consideration. And dami natin mga artista sa Senado. And who knows, maybe next president of the Philippines will be someone again uh, from from that kind of background. But but thank you so much, Pepe. I really appreciate it. I mean, we're the same age, so you know, I, I people like you succeeding makes me also more hopeful about our generations. We, you know, we millennials always get bashed. Oh, millennial, you know, it's a pejorative term. <laughs> so when I see my colleagues and peers, people exactly my age like you are are doing what they're doing. Uh, it allows me to, of course, push back against all those people bashing our our generation. But I I also hope that this provides a template for Generation Z, which is also very talented, very energetic, and very very unique generation in terms of their preferences and in a, in a great way for arts, for cinema, and for the nation building. Thank you so much again, Pepe, for, for this fantastic work. I look forward to watching your movie. Unfortunately, it's not here in Baguio yet, but once I watch it, uh, watch out for a review. I will bash you now. Just kidding. <laughs> no, no. no. Feel, and, say whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, and, and Pepe, I hope we can catch up with you again later on because I want to get your your... Sigura a post in the post more time, but but Sigura, once the whole dust settles, I want to get your idea about what are the lessons you learned from the Gomburza project. Hopefully, very good lessons. And if hopefully by that time you also have more ideas about what is the next project in mind. Uh, because I know many people are super excited to hear about you and your projects. And I also, also I want to separate episode Sana, Pagusapan natin, Encuentro, your other documentaries. You know, you have you have you have done so many works. Well ahead of us yeah. about the penitentiary system, about death squads, and Damanagawa, and you're a master of making so much with little mm -hmm. budget, right? So so thank you so much, Bea, for giving us this oh. time. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Enjoy have, the rest of your Baguio trip. Have a good day and uh, talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Bye. Merry Christmas.